Hello there! Today we're gonna discuss facts and fiction about zombies. Of all the creatures we encounter in fiction, zombies are one of the most universal. I mean, if you spot an alien or a robot, you can safely assume it's science fiction, and if there's a dwarf on a dragon, you are probably in fantasy. But zombies? They seem to somehow easily fit into both genres. So, can they be real to any extent? Should we be afraid of them? Lots of important questions to answer here, so let's get straight to the case. First of all, let's dig a bit into zombie history, which inevitably takes us to the practice of voodoo. Voodoo is an amalgamation of religious practices from an astonishing variety of cultures. It traces its roots to Africa, both Americas and Europe, and is a result of practices such as imperialism, colonialism and slavery. Voodoo emerged and proliferated in communities of slaves. It is decentralized, it has many names for its many branches, and it has so many pantheons, each stacked with its own set of gods, that they alone are worth an entire separate encyclopedia. Key point for us is, there is one voodoo branch in particular, the Haitian voodoo, wherein lies the origin of belief in so-called zombies. It goes as follows, an evil voodoo wizard, known as Bokor, uses a magic powder, a spell, and a ritual sacrifice to steal someone's soul and lock it in a bottle. A person soon dies without a soul, seemingly of some random disease. Then, after burial, Bokor comes to the grave at night and somehow mystically blackmails lifeless body with the soul in the bottle, makes it move and turns it into Bokor's mindless half-dead slave for life. Voodoo zombie might sound like just a dark fairy tale at first. Science, of course, has no definitive proof that such acts as a ritual sacrifice, magical spells and soul extraction from the body could be practically effective. However, there is one substance that might do the whole zombification thing scary possible – that powder. We know, after all, that psychotropic substances are capable to seriously mess with human brain. So, are there any known compounds of the zombie powder? Is it possible to acquire some? Has it uh, ever been studied in a lab? As it turns out, yes, we actually do have some papers on zombie powder compounds, both uh, theoretically possible and actually detected in chemical tests, most published in 80s and 90s. There are two main substances of interest here, both powerful plant and animal kingdom toxins. One of them is tetradoxin. It can be extracted from pufferfish relatives, the fugelfish, which are so difficult to cook and so risky to eat. Tetradoxin was considered to be primary ingredient at first, but the symptoms of its intoxication didn't exactly match the known spectrum of zombie symptoms. Tetradoxin usually just causes paralysis and kills. Also, tetradoxin was actually never found in zombie powder samples that made it to the labs. The second reported zombie powder ingredient is datura, a genus of poisonous plants from the nightshade family. Datura-derived chemicals might be responsible for the death-like coma state and the following long-lasting stupor that uh, feels like a very unpleasant type of afterlife and looks like death and the almost lethally poisoned hallucinating person might actually get buried. Some other substances were theorized to be part of zombie powder as well, but I won't go further into details, since <laughs> my aim here is not to give the precise recipe of how to raise undead, but to analyze the possibility of it, and the chemical explanation of voodoo zombies uh, sounds fine to me even despite the controversial lab test results. After all, voodoo was never strictly centralized, it has no single authority and no single set of rules, so I'd say it's quite possible that each bokor uses his own unique mix of toxic ingredients for zombie powder. Let's try to imagine how it looks through the eyes of the victim. You exist in a culture where zombies are a thing quite a lot of people actually believe in, you suddenly die, you get buried, then some dark wizard digs you out and says you will now serve him for life. All that, while you suffer through heavy brain damage from intoxication with a brew of organic poisons and uh, struggle to understand even things like uh, who you are, what is that place and uh, what's going on. A set of psychological mechanisms goes into action and uh, the person, no, not even the person, but the entire personality gets broken in a similar way as they do in Russia's gulags and totalitarian cults. So while it's probably not impossible to create a voodoo zombie through the use of toxins and cultural stigmas, these will have one significant difference from what we usually call a zombie. The unfortunate voodoo zombies were never completely dead in the first place, just heavily poisoned. And when we speak of a zombie, we surely presume that at some point it surpassed death. That's how our modern global culture defines zombies. Zombie is the one that unnaturally came from the dead, the undead if you wish. 
Our general idea of zombie is one of a monster. But uh, that wasn't always the case, since the original voodoo zombies were actually more of a victims. Becoming a zombie meant that you had to turn into a mindless slave and toil for your master forever, even beyond death, not become a rampaging beast hunting for more flesh and brains. So if we abide by the modern general definition, is it actually physiologically and anatomically possible to bring dead back to life? Thanatology, which is a science about death, distinguishes two main death stages – clinical death and biological death. Clinical lasts for around 5 minutes, as long as our brain can suffice without fresh oxygen, and then it becomes biological. Clinical death is uh, something from where you might still come back to life, but only in some cases and only if a proper CPR gets performed on a dying body. Biological death is uh, something where we don't have much left to save, and the process is completely irreversible. Biological death manifests in rigor mortis, liver mortis and algor mortis, also known as corpse rigidity, corpse lividity and decrease in temperature, which are basically indicators of critical failures in musculature functions, blood circulation and general body metabolism. There is also a state in between clinical and biological death, which some call social death, some call brain death, some call personality death and some refer to as simply coma. That's when reanimation came too late and all the complex brain structures got lost, but there are still some nerve cells alive, at least as much as necessary for heartbeat, given that hospital provides the rest. If you tell me zombie came back from clinical death, I'm sold. <laughs> I mean, it's in the definition. If you tell me zombie came back from coma, I'm skeptical but intrigued. If you tell me zombie came back from biological death, I demand some serious peer-reviewed evidence if the given piece of fiction still wants to play a real science. There are also different stages of decomposition that follow biological death, and uh, they are all even less likely to return from. Most well known is the putrid decomposition or putrefaction, famous for its green coloration, you know, the color of the old school zombies. During putrid decomposition, central nervous system of a human looks like a disgusting grayish green soup, very unpleasant in both consistency and smell and absolutely incapable of performing any of the brain's functions. By that I mean, expect a body in state like that to move around and do stuff is uh, the same as expected from a decapitated body. In a matter of weeks to months, depending mostly on climate, putrid decomposition reaches the stage of skeletonization. And well, <laughs> it doesn't take an academic degree to see why walking skeletons don't really fit in serious science fiction. If the conditions are very dry, a process known as mummification happens, and in this case it has little to do with surgery rituals that ancient Egyptian priests performed on their dead nobles. In thanatology, mummification is a simple natural process of desiccation, body losing all its water and decreasing in weight up to 10% of its former mass. <laughs> all these mummies that uh, threaten innocent civilians in horror movies, even if they once were bulky brawny men, in dried state they should wait about as much as toddlers <laughs> and shouldn't be capable of any physical movement at all. I mean, their muscles are basically ancient brittle beef jerky. There is also a lesser known taphonomical condition adipocera, which happens to corpses that stay in cool wet places for a while, like uh, moist soil or cold water. Adipocera, however, is as unsuitable for conversion into zombies as is mummification. In adipocera, all body fats turn into wax-like substance, which means in case of miraculous resurrection any movement would be impossible anyway. It would be like to expect movement from a human-shaped candle. So to sum it up, the less time has passed since since death, the more believable zombie is from a hard science fiction perspective. The next important question to answer about zombie biology is what power exactly makes the poor body rise from the dead? One of the most common causes these days are infections and, well, we might be up to something here. The most common pathogens that cause human infections are bacteria and viruses, and uh, some viruses do things that uh, really resemble zombies. There are rabies, for example. Animal infected with rabies acts and moves a lot like what we expect from a zombie. But despite all the stupid bitey behavior and foam drooling from the mouth, the infected still is technically alive. It passes through the gates of death just once and in one definite direction. So it doesn't qualify as a true zombie, I guess. What we can learn from rabies is the sheer potential of what viruses are capable of. Viruses are much smaller than bacteria, and they are much better adapted for invading and controlling organism structures rather than plain destroying and consuming them. 
Viruses should get inside human cells to act. That means they generally tend to play with their host for a while and often force the infected to do freaky stuff before the ultimate demise, like rabies do. Behavioral changes inflicted by various species of viruses include symptoms such as insomnia, irritability, hyperactivity and dumbness, which uh, altogether would give a splendid image of a canonical zombie. Bacteria, on the other hand, usually have a plain good old war against immune system. Bacteria are just in a slightly lower weight class than our organism cells, so they have to engage in open fight instead of stealth invasion. If host immunity fails and bacteria grows in numbers, most of their species just try to turn their host into a pile of rotting flesh to feast upon. There are of course some infamous examples of zombie-like bacterial infections that challenge human intellect, looks or behavior like uh, syphilis, leprosy or tetanus, but none of them come as close as viruses to what we expect from a zombie. Zombies are generally expected to have little to none personality and conscience, so that their murder has no moral consequences for protagonists. None of the viral or bacteria Bacterial infections can degrade human being that bad. But if I had to bet on whether our real-life mindless zombie plague would one day evolve from viruses or bacteria, I bet on virus. Then there are fungi. I know what you're thinking, and no, I won't be reading a lecture on Ophiocordyceps. That had been done numerous times by people far smarter than me. The key point I'd like to emphasize about cordyceps is first of all the length and the scope of contact between ants and fungi. They had coexisted in the same undergrowth and soil environments for more than 100 million years, so they had time to adapt and experiment. Some ant species have domesticated some fungi species, some fungi species became creepy zombie parasites to ants. Our tribe hominins, on the other hand, appeared just several million years ago, and uh, primates in general never shared the extreme habitat proximity with fungi, except for Paul Stamets, of course. So it's hard to imagine that some mushroom could evolve parasitism strategy that complex that fast on Homo sapiens. In fact, fungi are very poorly suited for infecting humans. One of the key issues is their relative size and visibility. I mean, while viruses play in full-out stealth invasion mode and bacteria might count on uh, at least a prize attack element, fungi are just uh, huge in comparison to human cells, so their detection is never an issue, which is a big deal in a blind world of white blood cells. Average healthy human organism deals with fungal infection easily. Fungi can sometimes cause skin and mucosa infections, which are aligned with dead cell layers and are not very comfortable for immune cell movement, but uh, these rarely progress to anything serious. The majority of cases when fungal infections become life-threatening for us humans are when our immune system is severely weakened like it happens in cases of HIV or chemotherapy. But say, what if we are in remote future sci-fi and some twisted CRISPR villain took off your cordyceps and uh, redesigned its molecular structure to fit humans as if they co-evolved and also somehow weakened everyone's immunity to spread the infection? Um, well, this villain's work would be arduous and unrewarding. The thing is, zombie fungi might have trouble resizing their tactics to warm-blooded mammals that have immune system way more advanced than that of an ant. Cordyceps doesn't really make it easy for itself. It does not actually capture the control centers of the host, like nerves or brains, which would be the most useful for behavior control. Instead, mycelium grows into muscles and uh, tries to become a neural network of its own, which would be too hard to accomplish on scale of human anatomy. So sorry guys, I'm afraid iron and glass tier is as high as fungi zombies go up the list. Besides fungi, viruses and bacteria, there is one commonly overlooked cause of infection – prions. Prions are the tiniest on this list, and uh, are even less alive than viruses. They are basically broken protein molecules that can outcompete normal proteins in metabolism. There's a prion disease known as Kuru, which, uh, take your checklists, gets transmitted via cannibalism, causes symptoms such as loss of ability to speak, general inability to properly react to outer stimuli, and the lead symptom is a progressive degradation of muscle control, which might produce behavior quite similar to what we usually imagine as a zombie gait. Given all that, I'd rate prions no lower than viruses as a possible cause of a real-life zombie plague. There are of course parasites of higher weight classes than fungi and bacteria, such as uh, protists, worms and arthropods. And uh, <laughs> as much as I'd love to discuss the possibility of a giant human hunting zombie wasps, uh, that would make me cross the line between zombie science fiction and alien ripoff science fiction, which is a topic for the whole other video on its own. 
Speaking of stuff that is in lower weight class than prions, we leave biology and get into the realm of chemistry. So what else do we have here besides the mentioned tetrodoxin and datura? Well, all the harmful substances can be divided into three main groups – corrosives, toxins and drugs. Corrosives are stuff like hydrogen peroxide, bases and acids. They are simple, they just kill organics on touch and they are very poor in terms of zombie turning potential. Toxins is a broad umbrella term I use for destructive poisons such as heavy metal salts, metabolic poisons like cyanide or carbon monoxide and carcinogenic substances of all kinds. Toxins are good at weakening and killing organism, and uh, while they can mess with its behavior sometimes, it is mostly in terms of uh, causing nausea, headaches, vomiting and unconsciousness. I would rate toxins as a robot if possible cause of zombie plague and move on to the most promising candidate of the group – the drugs. Drugs, besides being harmful for the organism, very often have complex and varied effects on behavior, which can lead to long-term lifestyle changes and in some cases can come extremely close to what we would expect from a real-life zombie. I won't go into details about which drugs exactly could lead to these effects, since uh, <laughs> this is not that kind of channel. I would uh, rather speak of limitations that drug-based zombies would have. First, since uh, organism naturally tries to get rid of drugs, such a zombie would require regular injections, which would result in tolerance and uh, other addiction-related issues, and uh, that would very soon lead the zombie to its final real death. Second issue is, drug-based zombies would be unable to infect the bitten ones, uh, unless they are equipped with uh, some <laughs> syringes instead of teeth. Third, to effectively function, drug-based zombies would need a rich cultural background to exist in, like we see in a case of voodoo zombies. Are voodoo zombies real? Well, I'm not quite sure about that. Could they be real? Very much diamond tier they could be. But could our well-known mess culture zombies arise from the drug poisoning? Given all the limitations, that's unlikely to be higher than iron and glass tier of possibility. Besides biological and chemical, it is not uncommon to see physical source of zombie issues, like radiation for example. Radiation sure makes people look bad. It is also kind of infectious if you hang around the dusty clothes of the enlightened for too long. On the other hand, radiation always weakens the organism and brings even more damage than bacterial sepsis or chronic drug use, thus rendering the irradiated revenant very bad at moving around and attacking people, you know, what zombies do. I bet real-life radiation zombies would pose danger only if you decide to loot them for an armor upgrade or accidentally <laughs> stumble with a bare foot on their open jaws. Honorary mention here goes to Fallout Girls, who managed to adapt to radiation and somehow mutate into coexistence with it, at the expense of getting quite ugly by human standards. As far as we know, the only life forms that are capable to survive, feed and reproduce under intense radiation are radiotrophic fungi and their entire existence is still widely debated. All the other known life forms on our planet inevitably wither and die if exposed to ionizing radiation, and that should certainly include human-derived real-life irradiated ghouls. Simply speaking, real-life radiation just debuffs and then kills you. No superpowers, no change in size, no even zombies. Another widespread physical source of zombification is electricity, and it goes hand in hand with the concept of composite zombies, commonly known as Frankensteins. Frankenstein is actually the surname of the creator, a sparing Italian scientist Victor Frankenstein, and the end result of his work was originally called Frankenstein's monster, but hey, who cares? What we deal with here is a zombie crafted from the pieces of different corpses and then reanimated by an electric spark. Concept uh, makes some sense, to be honest. Our immune system cells don't live long after death, so there will be at least no transplant rejection between the dead parts if muscles and skin somehow come back to life and if a well-preserved brain and heart get plugged into the system. The electric spark makes sense too. Our nerve and muscle cells use electricity to function and uh, we use it in defibrillators, the devices that literally return people back from clinical death to life. In a serious science fiction setting, however, electricity should be distributed smartly and delicately, not through those bolt nail brain implants. These are just gonna give the newborn Frankencraft an electric burn of its poorly stitched forehead. In other words, I'd say science fiction hardness of electricity powered composite zombies could range anywhere from tungsten to cake, depending on how exactly are they crafted. There is also a rare variety of technically augmented zombies, parts of rotten flesh risen and driven by mechanisms. 
It is important to distinguish tech zombies from humans augmented with tech, those would be cyborgs, and from tech that imitates humans, which are androids. Tech zombie is just that, pieces of rotten flesh completed with a metal internal and or external skeleton and or some artificial organs. Tech zombies make no sense. Decomposing body parts have strikingly lower durability and work span than their synthetic counterparts. Even if all the organic and mechanic parts get connected smoothly and uh, work together for a while somehow, organics will require regular maintenance and uh, replacement and it would be much easier to just make the whole thing mechanic in the first place. So while tech zombies are technically quite possible, it makes very little sense to make them in practice. There are also attempts to create zombifying forces whose nature is unclear to us, like alien civilizations that use zombie rays or something. But I insist that whatever mysterious mechanism will aliens use, it is gonna be based on either physics, chemistry or biology, maybe even all at once, but nothing too far away from what we have already discussed here. What we can learn from all these different zombie origin options is that uh, all of them are damn harmful for the organism, starting with the key definition point surviving death. Body of a zombie with any origin would be constantly weakened, grasping at the brink of collapse, which means it would be trying to save energy and drop metabolism to the bare survival minimum. Given that, let's think of scientifically accurate mode of locomotion that zombie could demonstrate. I would say diamond tear would be motionless horizontal position, you know, the thing that corpses do in real life. Tungsten tear would be crawling, that's what we do when we are very young, very old, very hurt or very ill. Iron and glass tier is a regular creepy cripple zombie walk then. Rubber tier are those athlete and acrobat zombies that got popular in recent decades, you know, the ones that are hard to outrun. Oh yeah, and the cake tier, the superhero zombies. Snyder, I'm looking at you. Speaking of metabolism, we must surely take a look at zombies canonical food source, brains. In here we've got an interesting situation. Practically speaking, consumption of brains, if they are fresh, is a very good way to gain as much energy as possible. Brains are about 60% fat, which makes them one of the most energy-dense meals in the wild nature. It would actually make quite a lot of sense for a zombie to want to eat brains, since uh, due to their weakened near-death nature, zombies require a lot of calories to at least somehow function, and raw brains are roughly equal in calorie output to stuff like eggs and crustaceans, which is rich. Brains are good in nutritional value only for as long as they are fresh, and as previously mentioned, brains are sadly one of the first things to decay after body dies. Given that zombies can somehow move with putrid porridge in their brain case, that would be actually a very good explanation why they always choose to crowd hunt a fresh brained human instead of attacking and devouring each other. However, the problem is, zombies are very bad at getting the fresh brain. The maximum bite force of an adult healthy human might reach up to 25 kilograms on incisors and up to 100 kilograms on molars. Using his hands, adult healthy human can produce a force of around 50 kilograms. Zombie is not adult and not healthy, it's undead and its muscles are decomposing, so its maximum strength must be significantly lower. Anyway, <laughs> to break a human skull you need a force of around 500 kilograms, which even an adult healthy human could achieve only with use of power tools. Zombies are not really known for their good skills in tool use, so it seems by the grimdark irony <laughs> The desired delicacy is fundamentally unreachable for them. Luckily for zombies though, there are lots of other energy-rich foods in the environment, some even better than human brains. A lot of these food sources will only last for very little after the apocalypse. All the stores and supermarkets will get eventually looted and there will be just nobody left to replenish the supplies. Some food sources, such as meat of chicken, cats and dogs, are either gonna get depleted as well or scattered away from the hotspots of zombie activity. In that state, being already familiar with the spectrum of threats that zombies can produce, fertile animals will require specialized skills to hunt, which zombies just don't have. Other calorie-rich foods will also require some specialized skill to reach, such as trekking and tree climbing. The intelligence level of a zombie is supposed to be strikingly low, since going through the death and back again is certainly scary harmful for the brain. And besides neural damage, there is also a plain physical obstacle to delicate skill use. I mean, decomposition of the body sure doesn't make it more agile or strong. Because of that, and uh, also because of the putrefaction gases, 
I would suppose zombies are also not very good of a swimmers. They would probably rather float like inflatable toys in water. That leaves zombie with a pretty bleak choice of vegan to omnivorous diet of easily reachable foods for not a very smart and uh, kinda sick adult human life form. Their best choices are snails, beans, berries, nuts, but those zombies will find only seasonally and if they are lucky. Their final retreat would be fruit and vegetables of the post-apocalyptic wasteland, and in such situation, stuck with a very low-calorie diet, I guess it's fair to assume that zombie would crave to eat some brains of human-sized prey to better suit their calorie needs. But remember the brain case barrier and consider one more fact. Near the well-protected nutritious brains, there is just slightly less rich, but much more readily available food source, which is human meat of course. It actually makes surprisingly lots of sense for zombies to want to eat human flesh, as it turns out. Human meat is less nutritious than chicken, pork or beef, but it is much more available since zombies generally have high chance of success when pack hunting humans. So if we rank the dishes zombies might have in their menu, flesh obviously ranks the highest, accompanied by the canonical brains with a side note about that pesky brain case cracking problem. Next we have highly nutritious seasonal foods, which zombies could technically get, like berries, beans, nuts and mollusks. To think about it, zombie herd might even establish migratory route between these seasonally rich locations and wander around like omnivore herbivores, just occasionally slaughtering a human or a cat. The iron and glass tier zombie foods are those that are too hard to reach for a canonical zombie, as well as those that would be too poor in nutrition to sustain at least some semblance of life in the undead. The lowest possible food tiers go, of course, to downright harmful substances, such as a radioactive waste, biohazardous goo, corrosives, poisons and other toxins. Besides diet, we should probably discuss such typical zombie behaviors as pack hunting or insensitivity to injuries. In fiction, crowding seems much more widespread among zombies than it should be. I mean, since mortal is not a thing for a zombie anymore, then well, if there is some functional muscle in your zombie body, why not eat him? And yet zombies keep ignoring each other, they just kinda move all together as a pack. And as such, they pose danger. While a single undead human, weakened both mentally and physically, is not really a threat and can be easily dealt with, the herd of zombies is the whole other thing. It's massive and it has many minds, albeit primitive and predictable. Zombie crowd might succeed in hunting prey that a single zombie would never dream of, like a group of living humans. They also gain bonus safety numbers, protecting members of zombie pack from a sudden armored transport massacre or a survival with a shotgun type of attack. So tolerating each other's meat would profit their species in the long term, since uh, as a coherent unit zombies are much more effective. Some remnants of social behavior patterns might uh, still persist in whatever is left of their rotten brains, so I guess it's safe to assume that pack hunting behavior is pretty much expected of any adequate zombie species. Another capability often ascribed to zombies in fiction is their high resistance to injuries. They act as if they don't feel pain and neglect even major life-threatening trauma. Could that be possible? Well, if zombie has somehow more or less intact brain after all the near-death experiences, it should feel pain. It's actually one of the things we usually feel to the last. If, however, that brain is injured and or partially decomposing, it kinda makes sense that some sensory functions will get lost. In regular corpses, brain is more of a putrid porridge rather than an organ. If zombie somehow manages to move and act without brain, well, then it might be absolutely robot level insensitive to injuries. But to stay fair, I must repeatedly point out, their chances to do literally anything with such a brain case content are abysmal. Actually, same goes for the freshly putrid brains as well. Another thing I'd like to address in zombie behavior is what I'd call zombie hunger kill switch. Let's uh, return to hypothetical roaming zombie horde scenario. Human flesh and brains are the most desirable food they can stumble upon, and uh, since zombies hunt in packs, competition for the slaughtered prey should be fierce, like among hyenas. That means, by the time the newly converted zombie decides to do some first steps in his new role, he might discover that he is now not actually a zombie, but more of a skeleton, or maybe even just a skull. It's a built-in kill switch behavior trap. Zombies really need to eat that fresh meat to replenish calories, but at the same time that makes their new generation crippled, disfigured, weak, if even they are capable of any movement at all, since movement usually gets done by the muscles, which just got eaten. 
Such a tendency will probably soon bring the entire zombie species on the brink of extinction, when the original population of non-feasted upon zombies will fall to accidental eggs, bat and chainsaw attacks, their infected offspring will barely pose anything resembling a threat in comparison. They will need to gather in bigger packs to hunt, and thus will have bigger dietary requirements, which means that in most cases an unfortunate potentially zombie prey human body will get stripped of the flesh to the bone completely. That in essence is a good thing. That actually means that almost every zombie apocalypse they show us in the movies must be self-limiting due to the inevitable demise first in zombie quality and then in quantity. Speaking of zombie apocalypse movies, um, I could probably make an entire separate video to rate uh, scientific hardness of Romero, 28 After, Walking, Snyder, Cordycepted and uh, other fictional types of zombie species. That however would take another half an hour, so for now I won't digress. What I'd like to address is the very fact of popularity that zombies have in our media and culture. While it's true that original zombie concept came from voodoo, a lot of civilizations across the globe had some made-up undead stories of their own. That leads us to question, if dead don't really often rise and pose threat, why would so many cultures decide to keep and cultivate these walking corpse monster stories? Well, the easy answer is, of course, zombies are easy. They are easy to imagine, they fit all the requirements to make up an antagonist, and it's much easier to make a zombie for a movie than, say, an alien or a robot. The cause for the emergence of original voodoo zombies is probably the sad one. It was suggested that the scary tales of becoming a zombie could have been used to persuade slaves that even after death they will not be free of work and uh, thus discourage them from suicide or escape attempts. But there is also a very useful practical side for the undead tales in most cultures which traces its roots to the same mixture of fear and disgust that we feel to some dolls and androids, known as the Uncanny Valley. One day I will probably make a separate video about it, but for now, in brief, Uncanny Valley is a natural mechanism that makes us feel uncomfortable if we see a human face with uh, some inhuman changes, like a putrefaction, an ugly ulcer, skull deformation from a fracture, or a piece of metal sticking out of face. It is an ancient instinct that tells us keep away from that weird face corpse. It either lies in a dangerous place where you can also suddenly get some extra metal in your head, or carries a deadly infection or whatever, but in no way you would agree that your own face would also look that weird ass way. That's where our natural fear of decomposing corpses comes from. And if that corpse is walking or even running towards you, well, we all can imagine how zombies can be scary. When I started this channel, I decided to study cases from all the possible scientific angles and, uh, well, we might be missing something before I sum up this zombie video essay. I mean, I already reviewed quite a variety of biological zombie options and have touched some physics and chemistry types as well. Voodoo zombie pretty much fits into the culture and religion science category with a close to adequate chemical explanation. So if we get rid of outliers and outline the key areas, we see two interesting phenomena. First, the more humanitarian is the science that produces a zombie, the more probable is its existence. And second, that empty spot about the politics, economy and law section with a very high probability to exist. Huh, yeah, they actually do exist. I wish they didn't. The zombifying propaganda is old as world and dumb as rock, it doesn't stand any sane logical criticism at all, but it somehow works, and it works well as hell. The irradiated ones decorate themselves with Z-shaped attributes and hurry to reach the death, often hurting and killing innocent people on their way. They are not really technically dead, of course, at first at least, but they demonstrate behavior incompatible with human beings, instead they act more as a stereotypical lemmings. They serve the function of a brute cannon fodder and do so obediently, even happily, for as long as they are alive, which is not much. I don't want to go too deep into modern politics, but I'd make an assumption that in the years to come zombie genre might go through a little renaissance by exploring the topic of propaganda brainwashed and morally degenerated Russian zombie army. So back to final thoughts on facts and fiction about zombies. Let's check out how zombie might look in a good hard science fiction. 
Zombies would certainly need either some cultural background or physical agent to appear, they would probably come back from clinical death and coma stages, with a very high probability they can be infected with some biological agent, composite electrified zombies are not impossible, robotized zombies are totally possible, but nobody in their sane mind would ever make them. Realistic zombies will probably lie down or crawl, which I agree is not great for action scenes. They will also most certainly want to eat brains, though probably won't be able to, and will have to retreat to human flesh consumption, which will in time probably lead them to extinction. Besides living humans, zombies could also possibly include in their rations some berries, mollusks, insects, nuts, beans, grains and other high-calorie foods found in nature. Zombies will also with high probability gather into crowds, as well as they can be really resistant to injuries, if only they somehow manage to function without brain. Then we know that zombies could have some potential in realistic historical movies about slavery. Also, zombies have natural potential for horrors, since they make us experience the uncanny valley phenomenon, an ancient and deep-seated fear that evolved in us for millennia to protect from infections and other threats. And also, we might expect some Russian-themed Castle Volkengrad action shooters or Overlord-type movies in years to come. Looks complicated? Uh, damn. Yeah, it really does look complicated. Sorry. <laughs> Ok, I'll better give some possible examples to show how it could work out. Imagine, we have a story of post-apocalyptic world with global population mostly wiped out by the zombie virus. Among the ruins, a zombie herd has learned to forage for all sorts of foods when human flesh is not available. They seasonally migrate around a limited area and uh, generally thrive without either killing anyone big and or multiplying in numbers. I mean, in other words, it's an ecologically sustainable and generally peaceful zombie herd. Vegan zombies, if you will. But then the humans show up, and uh, humans being humans do what they used to. Humans try to eradicate the undead. The undead, of course, might remember their ancestral habits and include humans on the menu back again, and uh, you can imagine the rest. Or imagine that, a guy from Russia, zombified with TV propaganda and promise of big money, decides to go to war and kill some Nazis in Ukraine, together with a bunch of guys with plans and ideas just like his own. The protagonist is sure not very sympathetic at first, and the only reason we actually follow him is because he is the only one who by accident survives the Ukrainian drone and artillery strikes. He is barely conscious from all the trauma and vaguely realizes that he gets transported along with other dead bodies in some military freezer truck or something and then he uncovers the horrifying mystery. To make up for the lack of soldiers, government of Russia secretly sponsored a military medical program aimed to create the UPRI, the Army of Undead Golems, 99% of details made in Russia. The obvious tone of such a movie would be a survival horror with protagonists trying to escape the zombification facility, but given his backstory that would not bring him redemption. A brave humanly thing for that survivor to do would be to uncover the key part of the mystery. Which country exactly broke the sanctions and sold the crazy northern dead that remaining 1% needed for his undead composites, the military-grade neurocompatible electronics? If we switch realism on maximum, however, that movie will become black political satire, since it will turn out that more than two-thirds of money assigned to the project was stolen, most of the necessary technologies don't exist, and the best that current UPRI models can do is to <laughs> crawl around and hope that someone steps on their jaws. Ok, that's definitely enough politics for today. Now, Imagine that, a zombie apocalypse ends in a self-limiting way, most zombies ate their victims so badly that new zombies got weaker and weaker. Before going totally extinct, however, one last zombie sample got captured by survivors. It is the only zombie alive in the known part of the world, and there are multiple options about what to do with it. Some advocate that it should be completely incinerated or something so that it all ends once and for all. Some propose to save it for science, like rare species or something. Some want to weaponize it and use for personal purposes. Many sides join and discussions follow, so we get a science fiction courtroom drama with all sorts of juicy colorful characters. <sighs> well, I guess for now that's all I have to say about zombies in science fiction. I suddenly remembered how I planned to make videos that last 10 to 20 minutes. I should certainly get better at that. Anyway, thanks for watching, and if you wanna support the channel, like, subscribe, and stay hardcore!